This video explores vitamin K2 and possible causes of deficiency. The following presentation is for information and medical debate purposes only. It's not intended to replace medical advice provided by medical professionals, but I do welcome feedback from the scientific community on the ideas presented within this video. Let's have a look at a summary of what's going to be in this video. First of all, we're going to be looking at the vitamin K-dependent proteins that are in the body. These are proteins that depend on vitamin K in order to activate them, to switch them on to do the jobs that they can do. And as you can see, some of these proteins are in our liver and some of them are around the rest of our body. However, studies show that as much as a third or more of the proteins around our body are underactivated. In other words, they can't do the job that they're designed for. And latest research is showing that when you look at the two versions of vitamin K in the diet, vitamin K1 and vitamin K2, vitamin K1 activates the proteins in the liver and vitamin K2 activates the proteins around the rest of the body. Now because the proteins in the liver are fully activated, but the proteins around the rest of the body are not, then this suggests that we must also have a vitamin K2 deficiency. So if we take a closer look at vitamin K2, we can see that there are various versions. Some are found in animal tissues, others in environmental bacteria, and others still in gut bacteria. And it's vitamin K2 MK7 in particular that is the one that's been most studied and is most commonly available as a supplement. But what is not known is how much of that MK7 is required to fully activate these proteins around the body. So if we look at the studies that have been done in this area, it would seem that the amount of vitamin K2 MK7 that's required is around about six to 700 micrograms per day, maybe up to a thousand or more. However, when we look at the amount of vitamin K2 that people are consuming, we can see at the most, on average, they're consuming between 30 and 40 micrograms per day. And this is nowhere near the minimum of six to 700 micrograms that the body would seem to need. And this would explain why there's such widespread underactivation of these proteins around our body. Now, if we look at the range of different foods across the human diet, there is only really one food that provides anywhere near the levels of vitamin K2 that the body would seem to need. And that is a dish of fermented soya beans available in Japan called natto. So does this single dish provide a clue as to why there's widespread deficiency in vitamin K2? So in an attempt to answer that question, let's have a closer look at the bacteria that's used to make this fermented food. And it turns out this bacteria and others like it are widespread across the natural environment. So we'll be looking at the ways in which our ancestors may have consumed these bacteria and how that may no longer be the case in the modern world and possibly explaining why as we transitioned from pre-agricultural to agricultural and industrialised living, our levels of vitamin K2 have steadily dropped. We'll also be looking at the ways we can get vitamin K2 into our body in the absence of these bacterial sources, both in terms of supplements and different foods. Now let's take a deep dive into vitamin K2 deficiency by starting with a look at the vitamin K-dependent proteins. So there are a number of different vitamin K dependent proteins around the human body that have a range of different functions and all of them can be activated by vitamin K. That process of activation is called carboxylation. Now these vitamin K dependent proteins fall into two groups. At the top here we have what are called the hepatic vitamin K dependent proteins. Hepatic meaning liver. And these are a collection of proteins that both help the blood to clot and to help thin the blood and they work together in unison to keep the blood just at the right level of clotting activity, but only if these vitamin K-dependent proteins are fully carboxylated. And below that, we have what's called the extrahepatic vitamin K-dependent proteins. Extrahepatic meaning beyond the liver, in other words, throughout the rest of the human body. And these vitamin K-dependent proteins have a diverse range of functions around the body. Matrix J protein, for example, has been shown to be beneficial at reducing arterial calcification, Osteocalcin has been shown to help strengthen the bones. And something called growth arresting sequence 6 protein, or GAS6, has been shown to be involved in cell growth and regulation and therefore has implications with cancer. And there's a number of other extrahepatic vitamin K-dependent proteins requiring further research. Now this research shows that since bleeding to death is the major and acute threat of vitamin K deficiency, vitamin K entering our bloodstream is preferentially transported to the liver the place where the coagulation factors are created. Only after hepatic vitamin K requirement has been met, the excess vitamin K is transported to the extrahepatic tissues. So in other words, the body is very clever at prioritising any available vitamin K so that it's sent to the liver. Because these vitamin K-dependent proteins in the liver are involved in the blood clotting process, 
are important for our survival, if they're not fully carboxylated, then it could potentially create a life-threatening situation. Whereas the extrahepatic vitamin K-dependent proteins do not present the same level of risk to health. Now, hepatic vitamin K insufficiency in healthy adults has never been reported, and it's generally accepted that all vitamin K-dependent coagulation factors are fully carboxylated in the normal adult population. This is in sharp contrast to the extrahepatic GLA proteins. So this is an important point. The vitamin K-dependent proteins in the liver are fully carboxylated across the population. It's very rare, if ever, that you would ever find an adult whose liver vitamin K-dependent proteins are not fully carboxylated. But the extrahepatic vitamin K-dependent proteins, however, are under-carboxylated. Let's look at this in a bit more detail. So if we look at all these extrahepatic vitamin K-dependent proteins, if we were to compare the ratio between how much of them are carboxylated and how much of them are uncarboxylated, we obviously don't want any proportion uncarboxylated. We want them to be fully carboxylated so that they could perform the various functions for which they're designed. And the two that have been most studied in this respect are matrix GLA protein and osteocalcin. And when you compare the levels of carboxylated and uncarboxylated, you find that on average, as much as a third or more of these vitamin K-dependent proteins are not carboxylated. Now, as mentioned, there are two versions of vitamin K that are commonly found within the diet. One is vitamin K1, known as filoquinone, and the other is called vitamin K2, menoquinone. And there's very little difference in the chemical structure between these two, but that difference has a big impact on the way these nutrients work within the body. Vitamin K1, for example, predominantly serves as a factor for activating the vitamin K-dependent proteins in the liver, whereas vitamin K2 activates the vitamin K-dependent proteins within the extrahepatic tissues around the body. So vitamin K1 is what's known as a hepatic vitamin. It mainly carboxylates the vitamin K-dependent proteins in the liver, whereas vitamin K2 is extrahepatic in nature. It's far more effective at being able to carboxylate the vitamin K-dependent proteins around the rest of the body. Now, the fact that the vitamin K-dependent proteins in the liver are fully carboxylated, but the extrahepatic vitamin K-dependent proteins aren't, suggests that there isn't a vitamin K1 deficiency, but there is a vitamin K2 deficiency within the general population. So let's have a look at vitamin K2 in a bit more detail. So there are many different versions of vitamin K2. There's menotetranone, also known as MK4, and this is mainly found in animal tissues. Then there are the menoquinones. MK5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 are found within environmental bacteria, and MK10 to 15 are found within gut bacteria. Now, out of all of those versions of vitamin K2, two that are most commonly available as a supplement and used within medical research trials are MK4 and MK7. And as you can see, the main difference between these two nutrients is the length of what they call the side chain. And this is really what the MK number means. It simply means the length of this side chain. But the length of that side chain does affect how these vitamins work within the body. So MK4 present in food does not contribute to vitamin K status as measured by blood levels of vitamin K. MK7, however, significantly increases the blood levels of vitamin K2 and therefore may be of particular importance for the extrahepatic tissues. So this graph, for example, shows when you give somebody 420 micrograms of vitamin K2 MK4 and then you test their blood at regular intervals over the next few days, you find that the blood levels don't increase at all. It just doesn't seem to register. But when you give them exactly the same dose of vitamin K2 MK7, you see the levels rise within the blood. And the reason for this is that MK7 is better absorbed in the human body than MK4. So putting MK4 and MK7 side by side, MK7 is the preferred version of vitamin K2. Now, in this research, a group of patients, before they were given vitamin K2, showed a certain level of uncarboxylation of matrix JA proteins. So this is one of the extrahepatic vitamin K-dependent proteins tested within the bloodstream. And as you can see, there's a proportion of uncarboxylated matrix JA protein. And what we want to know is, if you give somebody vitamin K2, does it bring that level down? And sure enough, after three months of supplementation with vitamin K2 MK7, you see a reduction in the level of uncarboxylated matrix GLA protein, showing that vitamin K2 is doing its job. Then you compare that to a group who are on MK4. This is again before they're taking vitamin K2 MK4, and it's at a similar level to the other group we just looked at before they took vitamin K2. But then after six months, you see their blood levels of uncarboxylated matrix GLA protein drop to practically zero. So what's going on? Because this is MK4, which is supposed to be not as effective as MK7. 
Well, the detail is that in the first group taking MK7, they were taking between 45 and 360 micrograms per day. But in the MK4 group, they were taking 45 milligrams per day. Now, 45 milligrams is the same as 45,000 micrograms. So this is a much, much bigger dose than the first group. And what this demonstrates is that vitamin K2, MK4 is capable of fully carboxylating the vitamin K-dependent proteins in the body, but only at very high doses. And these high doses are difficult to get hold of and they're expensive. So we really want to be sticking to MK7. But what we don't know is what is the ideal dose of MK7 to fully carboxylate these vitamin K-dependent proteins. So let's now try to work this out. Now, if we take the uncarboxylated amount of vitamin K-dependent proteins in the body and we try and carboxylate 100% of that uncarboxylated portion, what does the research show? Now, the undercarboxylation of matrix JLA protein in particular is a risk factor for blood vessel calcification, but the present RDA values are too low to ensure full carboxylation of matrix JLA protein. Now, vitamin K2 doesn't really have an RDA. We have to rely on vitamin K1's level for that, which is around about 120 micrograms, depending on where you are in the world. And when you look at the research looking at uncarboxylated levels of matrix JLA protein, you see that as you increase the dose of vitamin K2 up to 360 micrograms, you see this gradual reduction in the level of uncarboxylated proteins. So a number of studies have been done supplementing with vitamin K2 to see what the percentage reduction has been on those levels of uncarboxylated matrix JLA protein. And so if we look at these studies, we see a similar reduction. And if we put all of these studies together and place a trend line through them, you can see that on average, they seem to be heading towards something around about six to 700 micrograms per day, being the level that perhaps might fully carboxylate matrix JLA protein. What is indicated that the RDA of 120 micrograms on average causes a very small reduction in uncarboxylated matrix GA protein. We're only talking perhaps maybe 20% on average, maybe a bit more. If we go to some of the higher doses used in the clinical trials of 360 micrograms, we're maybe looking at maybe a 50 or 60% reduction in uncarboxylated matrix GLA protein. Even at higher dose of 500, we're still not there yet. So it would seem to be six to 700, maybe up to say something like a thousand or more before we can perhaps be fully confident that the extrahepatic vitamin K dependent proteins have been fully carboxylated. It's certainly nowhere near the 120 micrograms that is a suggested RDA for vitamin K2. Now, there's obviously quite a lot of variation on this graph. And part of the reason for this is a study show there's a high inter-individual variability in the bioavailability of these compounds. These are fat-soluble vitamins, of which vitamin K is one of them. And this is mainly assumed to be due to genetic variation. So this would explain, perhaps, why the graph is quite variable. And I think this is also explaining why in recent years we're seeing clinical trials of vitamin K2, MK7, using higher doses. So this one, for example, using 1,000 micrograms per day. So is it possible to get those sorts of levels of vitamin K2 in the diet? Can we maybe just eat certain foods in order to give us adequate levels? So let's first of all look to see what the average intake of vitamin K2 is. So as can be shown from this study, they've got vitamin K1 and vitamin K2, MK4. And MKN at the bottom there means anything above MK4, so MK5, 6, 7 and so on. And as can be seen... Those in the lowest consumption bracket are consuming only between 6 and 7 micrograms per day. And those consuming the most levels of vitamin K2 are consuming between 30 and 40 micrograms a day. Now, this is a big discrepancy. This is nowhere near the 6 or 700 micrograms per day, or maybe 1,000 micrograms a day, that is probably needed to fully carboxylate vitamin K-dependent proteins. Why is there this huge discrepancy? And I think this has caused a certain amount of confusion and concern among scientists because on the one hand, the human body would seem to need fairly high levels of vitamin K2. But on the other hand, there's hardly any available in the diet. There seems to be a significant shortfall. And the question that comes from this is why is that? Where is the missing vitamin K2 in the human diet? So let's have a look at various foods. Now, in this research, the first column on the left here lists the numbers of different types of foods. So at the top here, we've got six different types of whole milk, for example, and so on. The next column is the amount of vitamin K1. 
Now, we're obviously not interested in this because we know that vitamin K1 is not very good at carboxylating the extra hepatic vitamin K-dependent proteins. The next column is vitamin K2, MK4. And the numbers in this column are nowhere near the hundreds, if not thousands of micrograms that we would likely need in order to fully carboxylate the extra hepatic vitamin K-dependent proteins. And so this leaves the final column, MK5 to 9, which is all the bacterial sources of vitamin K2. And interestingly, as you can see at the top here, a lot of dairy products contain some amount of vitamin K2, either because they have bacteria directly in them already, or it's in part of the food chain in some way. But again, the levels are not that high, the highest here being 51 micrograms. Now, there are some commentators that say we should eat a lot of cheese in order to get vitamin K2 into our diet. But there are a couple of problems with that. The first is that historically, it wouldn't have been a natural part of the human diet. Dairy products are effectively a modern invention in terms of our evolution, and were very unlikely to be part of the hunter-gatherer diet that our ancient ancestors consumed. Now, the second problem is that you would have to eat quite a lot of cheese in order to get anywhere near the hundreds and hundreds of micrograms of vitamin K2 it looks like our body needs. And this would introduce a lot of saturated fat and salt into the diet. And there are numerous studies showing how those two things can be detrimental to health. Now, there's a couple of interesting things on this next table here. Now, you'll notice that goose liver paste contains fairly high levels of vitamin K2 MK4 at 369 micrograms. But all these measurements are for 100 grams of food. So even if this was the more potent MK7 version of vitamin K2, you would still need to eat three times that amount. So you'd have to eat somewhere between a quarter and a third of a kilo of goose liver every day. And that's if it was MK7. But being MK4, it's not going to be anywhere near as effective. So you'd have to eat a lot more than that. You'd probably have to eat kilos of goose liver every day, which again is a very unnatural thing in the diet. It's not something our ancestors would have had access to. So that's not a viable option. Now, pork steak is the only meat that seems to have some amount of vitamin K2 in it. It's not much, but it has some nonetheless. And secondly, of the different types of fish, it's only place an eel that contains some amount of vitamin K2. Now, research shows that it's been reported that flatfish and eel living at the bottom of seas and lakes contain small amounts of vitamin K2 that were regarded to originate from the bacteria in decomposing organic materials serving as their food. So there must be certain types of bacteria that are producing vitamin K2 in the decomposing organic matter that these fish are living on. And this might explain why pork steak is the only meat containing small amounts of vitamin K2. Perhaps because pigs are the only barn animal that are fed what they call slops, i.e. food waste, that may well have had a chance to ferment to some extent and therefore produce a certain level of vitamin K2. But interestingly, at the bottom of this table, we do see a food with very high levels of vitamin K2. 998 micrograms. This is the 1,000 micrograms that we're looking for. So what is this food? Now this is a dish called natto. It's a Japanese dish, and this is also fermented. And it would seem that for whatever reason, this fermentation causes very high levels of vitamin K2. Now when we looked at the research previously, those consuming vitamin K2, on average, were only consuming maybe 30 to 40 micrograms at most. As you can see from this research from Japan, there are some people who are consuming much higher levels than that, and it's probably because some of these people are consuming natto and other similar fermented products. So what is the bacteria that is capable of producing very high levels of vitamin K2 and turn something like this humble soya bean into the biggest source of vitamin K2 in the modern diet? So there's a particular bacteria called Bacillus subtilis that's found in several commercially available fermented food products including soya beans fermented with Bacillus subtilis natto. Now, a lot of these bacteria that are used in fermented products originate from the wild environment. And so where can we find Bacillus subtilis in nature? Well, it turns out it's a remarkably diverse bacterial species, capable of growing within diverse environments, including terrestrial and aquatic, so on land and in water, in close association with plant root surfaces, within the gastrointestinal tracts of animals, and within diverse settings within the biosphere. And it turns out that Bacillus subtilis is a very hardy bacteria in that it outcompetes other microbes that would otherwise adversely affect the plant. So you find this with certain bacteria. They can produce compounds that are very good at killing other bacteria, and it allows them to survive and dominate an area. Considering that Bacillus subtilis is found on and around plants, and that many animals consume plants, it's no wonder that this bacterium is often found in faeces. And as we saw in that study of fish consuming fermented matter at the bottom of rivers and seas, the bacteria that we or an animal consumes 
is capable of placing vitamin K2 into the food chain. Now, studies also show that Bacillus subtilis could colonize on melon roots and leaves in a large population. And I think what happens here is Bacillus subtilis is capable of multiplying to quite large quantities in particular situations. And here is a picture of what it looks like. The individual, what look like rice grains within rice pudding on the right hand side of this picture, are the individual bacteria. Now you wouldn't necessarily know that that is on the surface of a plant that you might be eating. The width of this whole picture is similar to the width of a human hair, for example, so it would be very easy to overlook this. Now one of the questions that comes from this is, is it just Bacillus subtilis that's capable of producing vitamin K2? Are there any other bacteria that can produce vitamin K2 to quite high levels? And if so, where can they be found? Now one of the first places to look for the answer to that question is within soil, because various soils contain very, very high number of bacterial species. And this study, looking at 140 bacteria isolated from soil samples, showed that a total of 60 of them were found to produce vitamin K2 MK7, with KLSG 10, 5, 1 and 11 producing good yield, but KLSG 9 was found to be the highest vitamin K2 producer, with a yield of 48 mg per litre. So what's that bacteria called? Well, the highest similarity to KLSG 9 was shown to be a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis, and it turns out that Bacillus thuringiensis is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. And it's been isolated from leaf surfaces, soils, infected insect larvae, aquatic environments, animal feces, insect-rich environments, flour mills and grain storage facilities. Now straight away there's an overlap here between Bacillus thuringiensis and Bacillus subtilis. Both are described as ubiquitous and both can be found on leaf surfaces, within soils, within aquatic environments, within feces, and so are basically very common within the wild environment. So could these explain in some way why there might be a shortfall of vitamin K2 in our diet? Maybe our ancestors consumed high levels of these bacteria in some way, and our modern life means that we no longer consume them to the same level. So let's look at this in more detail. Look at all the ways that humans now, or historically, may have encountered vitamin K2 in their diets. Now what we do know is that some foods contain some amount of vitamin K2, but natto is what you might call a post-agricultural invention. It's not something our hunter-gatherer ancestors would have had in the diet as a natural product. But bacteria does occur on the food that we eat, naturally. So this study, for example, shows that each apple harbours different tissues, stem, peel, fruit pulp, seeds and calyx, which are colonised by distinct bacterial communities. The bacteria composition was significantly different in conventional and organically produced apples. Now, if there are different bacterial colonies that change depending on whether something is organic or not, we can't rule out the possibility that that change may have an impact on the levels of vitamin K2 that are found within that bacteria. What we do know from this study looking at fruit, there didn't seem to be anything in the way of vitamin K2 and it says that they were bought from shops around Maastricht, but we don't know whether that was organic fruits or non-organic fruits. But this would be an important area to examine, because if it turned out, for example, that organic food, on average, contains quite a high level of bacteria that produce vitamin K2, that might help explain to some extent why there's common widespread deficiency in vitamin K2 within the diet, because the majority of food consumed is not organic in nature. So we'd need more research to clarify that point. The studies also show that multiple bacteria species used as starter cultures for food fermentation produce vitamin K2, but relatively little is known about the presence and distribution of vitamin K2 in food supply and its contribution to total dietary intake. The long-chain bacterial versions of vitamin K2 have also been measured in fermented plant-based foods such as sauerkraut and natto. Now, sauerkraut has very low levels of vitamin K2 and natto has very high levels, but the fermented food area is an interesting one. The modern day food that we consume is very clean and well prepared. That's not necessarily what our ancestors consumed. What our ancestors consumed may more often have looked something like this. If you're a hunter gatherer and you come across a tree laden with fruit, but most of it has fallen to the floor and is starting to ferment on the forest floor, you have to make a decision as to whether or not you're going to consume the fruit as best you can, or do you walk another two miles to another tree that might have fresher fruit on it? And I don't think our ancestors would perhaps have been as quite as fussy as we are today in the modern world. And the other thing to observe here is that this fruit's lying on the ground. 
And we do know that soils contain bacteria like Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus thuringiensis that produce very high levels of vitamin K2. So if this fruit has been on the ground for a couple of days, is it possible that bacteria from the soil get onto the fruit and multiply to quite high levels? So that anyone who then picks up and consumes that fruit or part of it inadvertently consumes reasonable levels of vitamin K2. As unpalatable as we may think this is, we can't rule out the possibility that our ancestors were taking a vitamin K2 via this route. And so we need more research into how much vitamin K2 is present in both organic and fermented foods. Now, because we're told that bacteria like Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus thuringiensis are within soil, on the surface of leaves, within the roots of plants and so on, when you look at a picture of a landscape like this, we're potentially looking at a very large tonnage of vitamin K2. And our ancestors lived within this environment. And so is it possible that somehow living within that environment could cause them to pick up bacteria and therefore vitamin K2 in some way? Well, studies looking at the Hadza tribe in Africa, and in particular their microbiota, their bacterial species that are in and around them, show that they shared bacterial families with other traditional societies that are rare or absent from the microbiotas of industrialized nations, microbes detected on hands, in the water, and on animal sources. The scientist here also observes short-term changes in these bacteria associated with the introduction of maize into the diet. They bought the tribe a big sack of maize, and this is an important area to examine as industrialization brings with it dramatic changes in diet. And so that would need to be explored in more detail as well. And so we can include unwashed foods and surfaces and wild foods, all potentially being sources of vitamin K2 from bacteria. Now there is something called geophagy, which is the habit of eating soil, and it has its human origins in tropical Africa, which is where we all humans originated from. And this practice has become a universal phenomenon, and it's also a common practice undertaken by many members of the animal kingdom. Now, the idea of eating soil to the modern westernised human would seem like a horrible thing to do. But here is a picture of a woman making what you might call pancakes from clay, and she's drying them here in the sun, and people come along and buy them and consume them. And being clay, it has a better mouthfeel than what we might think of eating soil being like a quite gritty and unpleasant. And in fact, when you look at the range of human beings on the planet, our history, our closest relatives in the animal kingdom, it turns out that the only people really that don't consume soil are mainly modern westernised humans. We stand isolated and alone in having lost this practice. So we are actually the odd ones out, not the people who consume this. And it's probably because we've lost touch with living with nature. We don't live in the wild environment anymore. We tend to buy our food from packages in supermarkets, for example. And it does seem to be clay in particular that is commonly consumed. And there might be good reason for this. Any good gardener will tell you that the rain tends to wash nutrients through sandy soils. And you're forever having to fertilise sandy soils in order to try and keep the nutrient levels up. But in clay soils, when it rains, the moisture and nutrients are trapped within the clay layer. And in fact, quite often you have to break the clay layer up with adding some form of sand or grit to it, or aerating it with a fork, or having plant roots grow through it in some way, in order to release the nutrients for plants to then take them up. But in the topsoil, as bacteria grow and feed and die, they produce lots of vitamins which would then soak down through that layer and get trapped in the clay layer. So it's a potentially very nutrient-rich layer. But what we don't know is how much vitamin K2 is in there. But it goes a bit further than that. Cooking in soil pits is quite common within less developed cultures. So they would dig a hole in the ground, light a fire within the hole, and then maybe put some rocks in there as well. Once the rocks have heated up to a sufficient level, the coals are raked out, the hot rocks are left in the pit, then foliage is put on top and then some foods put on top of that, maybe some roots or some meat or something, and then further vegetation is put on top of that. And finally, the cooking pit is covered in soil and the whole thing is left to cook slowly in the ground. So that's another possible way in which soil may have come in contact with the foods that we eat and in a way in which we no longer are exposed to. Now, because bacteria like Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus thuringiensis occur so commonly within the landscape, within the soil, on the surface of leaves, within the roots of plants and so on, every time it rains on these rich environments, a certain amount of vitamin K2 produced by this bacteria is going to be washed off the surface of the landscape 
into streams, then into rivers, and then out into the sea. And so a natural question is how much vitamin K2 might there be in wild water sources? Well, this study shows that indeed there is vitamin K2 in untreated water. And at the top of this illustration, we can see MK6, MK7 and so on. So we can add land nutrient runoff from bacteria as another possible source of vitamin K2 in our ancestors' diets. But it's not just from bacteria on the surface of the land. So this study showed that when rivers were analysed, vitamin K2 was observed in all samples of suspended and sessile microorganisms of the sites investigated. Now, sessile means attached to the surface of something. So what this basically means is that bacteria suspended within the water and attached to the surface of various things contained vitamin K2. Now, the idea that water would contain vitamins enough to counteract some sort of deficiency might seem like a very strange thing. But we have evidence of this in other areas. So, for example, this research shows that there's appreciable amounts of vitamin B12 carried on suspended particles in river water. Bacteria are significant producers and carriers of vitamin B12 in the marine environment. But could that actually make a difference as to whether somebody has enough vitamin B12 or not? Well, in India, where there are a large number of people who are vegetarian and vegan, scientists were concerned with the increasing numbers of people appearing with vitamin B12 deficiency in surgeries. And so scientists went into the region in order to study this. And as this research states, prevalence of vitamin B12 deficiency has increased in the community in recent time. Possibilities raised for new and yet unidentified factors being associated with this increased prevalence. One of these factors frequently questioned is the use of reverse osmosis process for drinking water. So this is the filtration that's used to remove various particles and possible pathogens and so on in order to sterilise and cleanse drinking water. And what they found was that the use of reverse osmosis was associated with vitamin B12 deficiency. Now, there's another nutrient that's associated with water, and that's iodine, rich sources of which exist in coastal areas and evolutionary scenarios associate the progressive development of brain size and cognitive skills to such landscapes. Bonobos are particularly interesting in this context as they are restricted to the central part of the Congo Basin, an area considered to be iodine deficient based on human standards. Their nutritional analysis revealed that the mineral content of aquatic herbs is higher than that in other plant foods. Lowland forests offer natural sources of iodine in concentrations high enough to prevent iodine deficiency in hominoids and humans. And what would appear to happen is that iodine that's found in small concentrations in the rain and in soil and rocks and so on washes off the landscape into rivers and the plants that grow in those rivers absorb the iodine and become concentrated sources of it. And here we have a picture of a bonobo who's eating aquatic herbs. And as you can see from the water that they're in, this water is incredibly rich in particles, there's going to be lots of bacteria in there, there's going to be a lot of nutrients in there. If this water was processed in a standard water processing plant, all of that would be lost. We associate in the modern Western diet getting vitamin B12 from animal products. But historically, it looks like maybe we actually got that from river water, because that was the only water available to us to drink. Not only that, but we no longer as humans consume the aquatic plants that it's quite possible our ancestors would have consumed. And this would be another way in which various nutrients could have found their way into our ancestors' diets. And as this research confirms, water processing reduces the iodine content in drinking and mineral waters with respect to the natural level of this essential trace element. And this causes knock-on effects. So, for example, in the UK, it was found that it was mild to moderate iodine deficiency in pregnant women. We demonstrated a higher risk of low IQ and poor reading accuracy scores in UK children born to mothers who were iodine deficient during pregnancy. And the reason for this is that iodine is an important nutrient for brain development. Now some countries get around this problem by having iodized salt. We don't here in the UK, and there is a debate about this that's been ongoing for many years. But as we've moved from our wild natural environment to a modern, more sanitized environment, there are dangers that we have lost certain levels of nutrition on the way. And even this report from the World Health Organization says that the total concentration of various substances dissolved in fresh water, considered to be of good quality, can be hundreds of milligrams per litre. Unfortunately, over the last two decades, little research or attention has been given to the beneficial or protective effects of drinking water substances. So even the World Health Organization recognised that there's a big gap in this area in terms of research. 
And it's important to note the importance of aquatic plants here because, as this research shows, 12 to 34 percent of total absorbed vitamin was transported to plant shoots, with proportionately more vitamin B12 transported at higher vitamin concentrations. So, in other words, the more nutrients there are within the soil or the water that the plant is growing in, the more it gets absorbed into the plant. Our ancestors would naturally have had to live near streams and rivers because of a constant need for water. And so it's quite likely they would have consumed a certain amount of plants that were growing in that water. Since modern humans don't do that so much now, maybe this is yet another area in which various nutrients, including vitamin K2, are no longer present in the diet. Now, vitamin K2 is found in other areas. Evidence like this, for example, shows that vitamin K2 can be absorbed from bacteria within the small bowel, supporting a definite role for bacterial production of vitamin K2 and contributing to the human nutritional requirements of this vitamin. And as we saw earlier with the research for the Hadza, the food that we eat can have a significant impact on the bacteria within us and around us. But it goes beyond this level. So there was this study trying to determine the true habitat of Bacillus species. And what they found was that Bacillus subtilis and probably other species have adapted to life within the gastrointestinal tract and should be considered to be a gut bacterial species rather than just solely a soil bacterial species. We need more research in this area to see how different diets affect the quantities of those bacteria and how that in turn may affect the levels of vitamin K2 that we absorb from that. Now we know that there's vitamin K2 producing bacteria in the gut of humans and other animals, but we don't know the extent of this. It is quite possible that all of the birds, insects and animals that exist within the world are producing large quantities of vitamin K2 and distributing it across the surface of the planet in their faecal matter. And as that breaks down, it then releases vitamin K2 into the clay layers and runs off the land into watercourses. But it's also possible our ancestors would have consumed it more directly by eating insects. There are quite a lot of places around the world where insects are still consumed. And we know that our closest relatives, chimpanzees and other primates, consume insects regularly. What would be really interesting is to study these insects and see how much vitamin K2 is found within their guts. And although many of us in the developed world may not like the idea of consuming insects, it's very likely that all of our ancestors would have consumed them at least occasionally, if not regularly, as part of the diet. So if we look at all of these different possible sources of vitamin K2 in the diet and compare what our ancestors might have consumed to what we currently consume in the modern Western world, we can see there's a big difference. So for a start, we tend not to consume much in the way of wild foods and insects, so we can cross that off the list. We might consume some organic and fermented food, but maybe not to the level our ancestors would have consumed, so we can perhaps half cross that one off. We wouldn't be exposed to the same level of unwashed foods and microbiome that primitive cultures and our ancestors would have been exposed to. We've also lost the practice of eating soil and cooking in earth pits and having other close associations with soil and the vitamin K2 that might be present in there. We no longer tend to consume water directly from streams and rivers, mainly because it's not safe to do so now in our modern industrialised and agricultural world, and therefore we don't get exposure to the various microorganisms and bacteria that are suspended within the water that could be producing vitamin K2. We no longer also eat the aquatic plants that it's quite possible our ancestors would have consumed, and we don't have the same exposure to faecal matter, either indirectly through runoff from landscape or directly by consuming insects. What this represents is that there are multiple possible resources of vitamin K2 in our ancestors' diets that are no longer present in the modern diet. Now, it's very difficult to ascertain exactly what impact that would have on vitamin K2 levels. We obviously need more research. So it's quite possible that the wild foods, insects, organic foods, fermented foods, unwashed foods, unwashed surfaces, edible soil and cooking pits, untreated water, aquatic microorganisms, aquatic plants and faecal matter that our ancestors would have been exposed to resulted in vitamin K2 levels that are nearer to the level that it would seem that our body needs. Maybe something around about six to 700 micrograms per day or more. Now, if this is correct, then as we transitioned from a pre-agricultural society to an agricultural and then industrial, each stage of that evolution has increasingly crossed things off this list to the point where modern humans perhaps now consume much lower levels of vitamin K2 in the diet. 
The trouble is we don't know the proportions of each of these. We need more research in every one of these areas in order to establish which are the major sources of vitamin K2 that could have been in our ancestors' diets, and why all these proteins are undercapoxylated in the modern general population. Now an additional factor in this is that research shows that the effects of long-chain versions of vitamin K2, such as MK7, on normal blood coagulation is greater and longer lasting than either vitamin K1 or vitamin K2 MK4. This effect from vitamin K2 MK7 was attributed to its very long half-life in the blood. Now, as we saw earlier, the MK number, whether it be MK4, MK7 and so on, relates to the length of the side chain on the chemical structure of the vitamin. And this longer side chain would seem to allow the version of vitamin K2 to last for longer in the blood, therefore allowing for a greater level of carboxylation of the vitamin K-dependent proteins, either in the liver or throughout the rest of the body. Now, MK7 is fairly low down this list, and it's quite possible that the higher versions of vitamin K2, in particular the gut bacteria versions, MK10 to 15, with their longer side chains, may be even longer lasting and therefore even more effective at carboxylating vitamin K-dependent proteins. So assuming that the average adult requires around about 1,000 micrograms of vitamin K2 MK7 per day in order to fully carboxylate their vitamin K-dependent proteins, it's quite possible that if instead of vitamin K2 MK7 they had these higher versions of vitamin K2, that a lower dose may be required. So what are the modern sources of vitamin K2? How can we get satisfactory levels of it now? Well, research concerningly shows that the composition of dietary supplements with regard to the contents of vitamin K2 was extremely varied. And so if you look at this table, in this column we have what the manufacturers say should be the level of vitamin K2 in the supplements, and the column on the right here shows what the actual level was when they measured it. And as you can see, there's a discrepancy. Now there is a pattern. Those supplements where it wasn't clear how the vitamin K2 was produced for the supplement showed lower levels than what they claimed the supplement had. But all of the supplements that said they were from Natto had levels close to or above what the manufacturer stated. Now, this isn't conclusive evidence by any means, because this is only a selected number of products, but it would suggest that perhaps when taking a vitamin K2 supplement, taking one that's made from Natto might increase the chances of it being at the level or higher than what the manufacturer claims. Another source of vitamin K2 is from the Japanese dish natto, which is commonly available in Japan and can be found elsewhere in the world from specialist suppliers. And a portion of natto might contain as much as a thousand micrograms of vitamin K2 or more. So in summary, there is very good evidence to show that the extra hepatic vitamin K dependent proteins are severely undercarboxylated in the general population. There's also evidence to show that it's vitamin K2 in particular that mainly carboxylates these proteins. And this therefore indicates there must be widespread vitamin K2 deficiency. And when you look at all the possible sources of vitamin K2 in the diet, it's quite clear that the main dietary sources of vitamin K2 are bacterial in origin. There's also evidence to show that we consume less bacteria than our ancestors, and in particular the bacteria that are shown to produce high levels of vitamin K2. This might explain why there's widespread undercarboxylation of the extra hepatic vitamin K dependent proteins. And it would seem that the bacterial menaquinones, as they're known, versions of vitamin K2, need to be measured in the wild environment, in indigenous cultures, and in primates, in order to establish the natural levels of vitamin K2 for human beings. And the reason why this might be of particular importance is because there is some evidence to show that vitamin K2 may play a pivotal role in muscular dystrophy, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, cancer and a range of other medical conditions. Now as we scroll through the references here I'd just like to say thank you for watching. The information in this video is for medical debate purposes only and I welcome feedback and suggestions from anybody within the scientific community to see whether the information provided in this video may help to move our understanding of vitamin K2 forward in some way. There's another video that I've created on this channel that looks at the possible links between vitamin K2 and muscular dystrophy the link will be appearing at the top of the screen now, and it can be found in the text below this video, where I look in detail at how vitamin K2 may help regulate calcium within the muscles of those with muscular dystrophy.
which could have significant influence on the progression of that condition. Thank you for watching.